haven't actually managed to see any of them or in case you want to kind of refresh your memory. So in case you, or in case you want to, I'm sorry, to, uh, to refresh your memory, you can always go back to our website. There's a dedicated page in our website about the call and you can find the presentations, the recordings and a lot of material concerning the call from the timeline to actually a frequently asked questions page and many, many more. So um, concerning today, coming back to today, uh, we'll be having an excellent lineup of speakers, both from the EAT and the European Commission that I will introduce to you in a bit. But the webinar will not be successful if we don't have your participation. So we really want to make this webinar as interactive as possible. This means that we want you to take your notes and ask questions. You will have the possibility to ask your questions either through the Q&A button or through the chat where my colleague will also be there to support you. Uh, we will have a dedicated uh, session on Q&A at the end of this discussion, at the end of the webinar, around 20 minutes. And uh, you can ask your questions um, during the entire webinar. If we don't manage to answer any of these questions, you shouldn't worry, you will be able to find the answers within the next days in the dedicated page that I mentioned before. So without any further delay, uh, and you can see by the way in the screen, the, the rules, the house rules will say, I would like to invite my colleague, Martin Herzeg. He's the head of unit for strategy and impact here at the EIT. And he will present to us synergies between the EIT and other EU programs. Martin, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much, Katerina. I hope you hear me well. And well. now Zoom is using the correct microphone indeed. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today once again. Uh, let me also share with you a couple of slides just to support my presentation. I hope this will start uh, very, very soon. Uh, I think you can, you can see it. So once again, warm welcome uh, to all of you. Great to see so many people have already joined. Um, before we go into the details about uh, strategic synergies and complementarities with EU and other programs, uh, I would like to re just recall, I mean, for those of you who have attended the previous webinars, it's probably not entirely new, but I would just like to recall the three main strategic priorities under the EIT strategy for 21-27. As they also drive all priorities in terms of the, the synergies and complementarities within the Horizon Europe program, but also within. So first and foremost, to increase the impact of the EIT knowledge and innovation com communities and the knowledge triangle integration model, we will strengthen the existing uh, kicks on the one hand. On the other hand, we are launching two new kicks. One of them is obviously the EIT culture and creativity. This is why we are here. The second important priority is to increase the innovation capacity of the higher education sector by supporting around 750 higher education institutions with funding, expertise and coaching toward the development of economic activities within their areas of scope. Again, this is something you may have heard uh, from my colleagues at the previous webinars. And the third one is about the EIT regional innovation scheme, mainly regional outreach of the EIT in order to address regional disparities in innovation capacity across the EU and to increase the regional impact, but also to include the development of links between the innovation communities and, for example, smart specialization strategies, which is an EU initiative to spur economic growth and job creation by enabling each region to basically identify and develop its own competitive advantages. So this is just a strategic framing. Obviously, we continue doing a lot of other things uh, that we have already started before, but these three main strategic priorities, of course, underpin uh, or uh, approach as well. The third, uh, the, the other important element here on the third slide you can see here is that uh, basically the EIT is part of the Horizon Europe program. So obviously we are, you know, thinking that, that the synergies are at the heart of the EIT activities, and this is why we warmly welcome this uh, program. As you can see here, the EIT is located in Pillar 3 of Horizon Europe, together with the European Innovation Council, the EIC. But we're also very well equipped to support uh, activities in the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 as well. 
uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, these uh, can, can see it on the slide, but I will also give a few examples. Obviously, we need a coherent approach in, in innovation for the benefit of, of Europe's innovators and entrepreneurs. And through these strong synergies, we will continue to power the innovators and entrepreneurs also in this new sector uh, across Europe to turn the best ideas into products and, and, and services while creating jobs and delivering sustainable economic growth opportunities uh, and, and scientific uh, and industrial leadership examples in, in, in Europe. So this is why we are working in synergy with other EU programs and instruments. And this is always be a top priority for the, for the EIT. So just a few examples. I mean, a future will work will build on some of the strong existing collaborations we have. My time today is too short to go into details, but I will be able to flash a couple of these examples uh, that we have already established or are in the making. So we have already forged strong partnerships with, for example, the European Commission in the past years. And we are confident that these can serve as very good inspiration for future corporations as well as the benefit of future kicks uh, as well. So, for example, since 2016, we've been working with the European Commission's Joint Research Center, the JRC, through a Memorandum of Understanding or an MOU. You will hear, hear this abbreviation today probably a couple of times. Uh, in the areas of regional development, education, skills, knowledge management, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, for example, but also, again, linked to smart specialization uh, strategies. We have strong collaboration with the European Union's Intellectual Property Office. Uh, we have um, that um, we signed an MOU again in 2020. This collaboration agreement is to help Europe's uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to build their knowledge of intellectual property, for example. Uh, we are also um, establishing collaborations, for example, with the EIF, the EIC, uh, and the DG Environment. I will talk about uh, EIC and EIF in more details uh, also later on in the next slide. With DG Environment, uh, the, the, the cooperation of area is on the environmental technology verification, which is relevant for some of the existing innovation communities. But of course, on the top of it, we also have other collaborations uh, in the making, for example, with the European Patent Office, uh, with the European Cooperation in Science and Technology, for example. But there are also examples um, I, can, I can mention at the level of the individual innovation communities. You see a couple of those listed here, uh, very prominent ones on European Battery Alliance, uh, attended, for example, by Inno EIT InnoEnergy, uh, presence in policy advisory boards, uh, European Raw Material Alliance, uh, where EIT Raw Materials is uh, most prominent, um, links to missions, for example, in, 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 the, in the second pillar. Um, I can mention the, the cancer mission, where some of the kicks are uh, presented and featured in, in, in there as well. So just a few examples, I think uh, there is no time really to go into all the details. But these are all very uh, strong bases for the future. And obviously, uh, they can show the way forward, maybe for the, the future kicks as well to, to build further, further on. Uh, obviously, one element here is uh, collaboration with the European Innovation Council, the EIC, which is a must for us. So I'm glad to hear we have a, we have a colleague with us. So you will also probably hear a bit more from their perspective on this, this collaboration. Uh, but we have started to collaborate with the EIC already uh, while it was in a pilot phase back in early 2020, and to provide strategic guidance on cooperation opportunities. And we signed an, a memorandum of understanding in uh, early uh, January as well. Also a separate one it was uh, ag agreed with the three first innovation communities, EIT Climate Key, EIT Digital, and in the EIT Inno Energy. Uh, to, so we established a joint strategic framework for this uh, cooperation. Um, and this uh, also means, for example, some dedicated uh, common support actions to, to some of the uh, innovation uh, communities. 
but we're also looking into other synergies, for example, on uh, ecosystems, or financial instrument programs, and making sure that there is a coherent uh, approach in, in that. In the first steps, the main focus was, uh, for example, on the fast track mechanism, uh, channeling uh, uh, earlier EIT supported companies to the EIC accelerator, which was put in place. Uh, but we also need to, of course, work strong, uh, work closely on a strong alignment between our work programs to develop full coherence. For example, maybe Federico will also speak more about uh, uh, the results of EIC in so far. But we have checked that uh, 20 out of the 65 successful companies in the most recent EIC accelerator call have actually been coming from the EIT community earlier, showing a strong uh, potential for those companies who benefited from EIT uh, support. I can also mention, just again, flash up uh, a few examples from uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Obviously, the EIT, uh, build on, building on the strong education program we have, have strong ambitions for future synergies with the Maris Kodlovska Curie actions. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, the Horizon Europe uh, uh, missions as well. Uh, we believe the IT community can act as provider of entrepreneurship and innovation skills in pan-European research networks in terms of the Marie Curie uh, actions. Um, the IT community is also well placed to contribute to, to missions like the climate, neutral smart cities, the cancer, soil health food. So there's a lot of uh, potential there. Again, I think the future kick uh, and kicks will also have this uh, possibility. I would like to also mention um, that looking beyond Horizon Europe, uh, there are also other programs and instruments. Of course, the European Structural and Investment Funds uh, offer a crucial opportunity in this sense, especially under the cohesion policy. We started uh, cooperation with the DG Regio on the implementation of these synergies. Um, so we had a lot of joint discussions with uh, the different member states and managing authorities for those countries which are under the EIT regional innovation uh, scheme um, as well. Um, if I also, yes, uh, go into the details I've mentioned earlier, for example, with the European Investment found. This has also been established for some time already. Uh, we are also in an, under a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, which we signed just a short time ago in September 2021, an area such as access to finance for innovative ventures. Again, a topic you may have heard during previous webinars, Green Deal and digitalization priorities, EIT community initiatives in technology, education, and again, support for the risk countries. We are discussing an, uh, an EF Investors Days uh, to give EIT kick supported ventures the chance to meet uh, uh, EIF VCs and investors uh, also from risk countries. This is just a very preliminary idea at the moment, but you can see this is how we build up uh, all these strategies uh, and, and cooperations to, to bring fruit as well. Um, last but not least, I would also like to mention uh, that, uh, for example, under the Digital Europe program and Erasmus Plus, there's strong potential. The EIT kicks have over 60 co-location centers, now you know, spread all across Europe. Uh, and we intend to work together with the European Digital Innovation Hubs to support digital transformation. Uh, additionally, the, we will explore the possibility uh, for using this capacity and infrastructure uh, in education and training, data resources, artificial intelligence, uh, computing competence centers, for example. And also in the higher education, we plan to link up with the Erasmus as well on a number of uh, uh, potential ways, for example, to help Erasmus students who are participating in higher education institutions partnered with the EIT KICS to access KICS uh, summer schools, training opportunities, alumni networks, uh, to train academic staff uh, and that integrate specifically entrepreneurship and innovation uh, as well. We aim to support the testing, adoption and scaling up of innovative practices developed within this net the Erasmus network, but also could be a source of supplementary funding for mobility, obviously. So mm, I think um, 
probably last but not least, I can also mention the, the potential with the new European Universities uh, initiative where we believe the IT can serve as a role model as well. So again, this is just a very, very short uh, recap on where we are to date. You can see we have some strategic priorities that underpin uh, our approach. We have uh, our place within the Horizon Europe in Pillar 3. And we have a strong basis uh, from past corporations, but also a lot of very recent ones and ongoing ones. So this gives us a very strong mandate with the eight as that established and the two new kicks to come uh, to actually work together with, with other programs. Uh, in the introduction, I have mentioned a few uh, um, synergies which are individually uh, run by our innovation uh, communities. You can see here a list of those to exemplify this, um, not to uh, mention again uh, many of them. But I think this gives also uh, an insight and a potential recipe on how one can work and, and forge uh, the strategic synergies with uh, other programs as well. So with this, uh, I would like to thank for your attention. Of course, I will be available for future questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. You presented a very, very uh, comprehensive list of synergies of the EAT and the kicks, of course, but I have a question for you and I need a quick answer also. So can you please let us know how the kicks are actually involved in the design of these collaborations that you presented? Okay, so try to be short. Uh, some of these are kick specific ones. I wouldn't probably go into that. Uh, the pan EIT community ones probably is more relevant uh, here. Of course, you may have heard during the previous uh, webinars that we have a lot of collaboration at strategic but also operational level with each of the innovation communities through our work uh, with uh, innovation uh, teams, the education teams. Uh, the risk teams, uh, business creation teams, and so on. So while the EIT is taking the main role and lead uh, on uh, establishing the synergies I've mentioned, we are, of course, in constant dialogue with the KICS, making sure that we are identifying specific uh, uh, possible uh, cooperation means also for the sector, for a specific country or a specific topic, for example. Thank you very much. So what I keep from what you said is that EAT is a door opener and facilitator for the kicks, maybe. And Absolutely. then the kicks jump in and deliver. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Please stay with yeah. us because at the end of the session, you will join us for the Q&A part. Uh, and I want to remind also to our uh, participants, to our guests, that they can ask their questions already in the chat. So the next topic for, um, for today is about global outreach and collaboration. And I will be the one actually uh, sharing this presentation with you, presenting to you. Just give me a minute. Okay. So um, talking about global outreach, and probably you will be wondering why is global outreach now part of a session about collaboration? Well, the reason is that we need global outreach for international and co international cooperation if we actually want to tackle the, the challenges, the global challenges that Europe and the world are facing. And the baseline for us here is actually um, the EAT vision, which really says that, uh, yeah, as EAT, we need to develop world-class solutions to tackle the societal challenges. And the reasoning behind that is to support and contribute to European objectives. So increase the competitiveness of Europe and reinforce its international attractiveness. So this is why uh, EIT, a European Institute, an EU program, is actually interested to expand its footprint also beyond Europe. Um, the framework under which we operate with regards to our global activities um, is um, the EU global approach on research and innovation. And here uh, I'm mentioning four reference documents, I would say, from Horizon Europe strategic plan to the Horizon Europe regulation, which describes clearly um, uh, there are research and innovation activities at international level. And of course, the most recent documents are the European Commission communication on the global approach for research and innovation, which is nicely complemented by the Council conclusions. So there is a revamped, a new approach, EU global approach on research and innovation, and EIT is fully aligned uh, to this uh, new approach. Um, I also want to highlight 
two particular references to this uh, to the EIT and the KICS potential at the international level for international research and innovation cooperation, um, which is mentioned uh, in this communication, uh, sorry, in the Council conclusions. So the EIT is really acknowledged and it's key as an important global player to contribute to the EU's uh, objectives at this level. Uh, I think that something that is also important to highlight here is about third country eligibility. Um, this is relevant both for the EIT international uh, activities, international cooperation activities, but also for participation of uh, organizations and entities from third countries to this new uh, EAD kick and of course the existing ones. So here um, I will only mention that as a general rule, what you need to know is that the EAT eligibility rules, both for participation and funding, are fully aligned with Horizon Europe eligibility rules. We are integrated part of Horizon Europe, so whatever stands for Horizon Europe stands also for the EAT. Now, coming back to the EIT community, global outreach activities, um, I think it's important to, when we set the scene, to understand that we're talking about both individual kick activities, but also about coordinated kick activities. Um, so this is the offer from the EIT. And both of them, both individual kick activities, meaning activities that are delivered at international level by each one of the kicks, but also activities that are delivered by, through a collaborative effort of different kicks. They're all, let's say, guided by the EAD strategic framework on global outreach activities. So this is our own framework, which again describes the EU global approach. You can find it on our website. And in a few months, it will be also revised, updated to uh, be fully aligned with the new EU global approach. Um, what is really important to understand for the individual kick activities is that in order for a kick, including the upcoming new kick on culture and creative sectors and industries, to receive EIT funding for international cooperation activities or in general for global outreach activities, um, they need to fulfill some criteria. So first of all, um, they need to be aligned with EU policy priorities. And of course, the bilateral international cooperation agreements in science and technology with the outreach locations. So activities need to be fully aligned with these. Um, they need to contribute to the key strategic objectives. And of course, the element of financial sustainability. So whatever activities, kicks design, international level they really need to contribute to their strategic uh, objectives and directions and the last one is that they need to contribute to the EIT objectives and of course uh, this is by the EIT core key performance indicators so these are the minimum criteria for this international activities to be delivered um, I won't elaborate more on these you can easily find examples of these activities online the individual kick if you want to have a look but what I would like to elaborate a bit more on is a coordinated kick activities. And here, I think that the best examples that we have at the level of the EAT community is the Global Outreach Program. So this is a cross-kick collaboration. Um, so an effort uh, taken by several kicks and steered strategically by the EIT. So this uh, program was launched back in 2018. So we're actually in the fourth year of implementation already and has a very concrete uh, mission. So the main idea here is to showcase European innovation and bridge the EIT and the European innovation ecosystem with innovation hotspots worldwide. So it's all about building strategic alliances, alliances to fight to actually, sorry, to tackle uh, global societal challenges. Uh, in terms of, of the goals of the objectives that you can see here, um, I would say that it's mainly about attracting partner organizations and talent. It's about strengthening the EIT brand globally and forging strategic alliances, as I mentioned before. It's, and of course, it's about contributing to strengthening European leadership and tackling the major societal challenges that both Europe and the world are facing. So this is the background, the main idea and the mandate, let's say, of this EIT Global Outreach Program. Um, what is the picture today? So first of all, this is a collaboration between seven out of the eight existing EAT kicks. Uh, one kick, as you can see, is uh, EAT in Energy particular has an observer status, so they are fully informed that they can easily jump in at any point uh, and contribute to this, um, in this activity. Um, so until now, we have two established offices in two outreach locations. So this is Israel, Tel Aviv. Of course, Israel is an associated country and US Silicon Valley, which is considered a third country. So you can see that this global outreach program covers also both 
associated, non-associated countries to Horizon Europe. So it's totally up to the each of the kids and their particular strategic interests to participate and contribute in each one of these locations. And we also have, we are also considering the possibility to continue and have coordinated activities and efforts in two more locations, as you can see. Um, UK and London is one of them. And of course, there's a fourth location with a visibility study ongoing. So we'll decide and see how this will go in the near future. What is also important to highlight here is um, how do we decide in regards to the, to the activities that we deploy in this, uh, in this location. So this, we talk about offices, we talk about staff on the ground, and we talk about uh, bridging the two ecosystems, European and the largest location. But what is the idea? We don't want to compete with individual kick activities, but we want to complement. So first of all, activities deployed by these hubs need to reflect the EIT innovation model. So they need to provide uh, deliver activities under the umbrella of innovation, entrepreneurship, education, of course, ecosystem development. Secondly, they need to address needs based on identified gaps by utilizing the EIT expertise and of course, resources. Um, so for example, I will mention the example of Israel. We have seen and we have been in contact with the Israel authorities, but also with the EU delegation, the European Commission. We saw that Israel um, has been doing very well with mono beneficiary, uh, let's say, programs in Horizon Europe, but they were kind of lacking with regards to, um, um, let's say, programs that are about consortia. So we're actually prepared to together with our hub, the program that can support them in having, in creating consortia with European companies so that they are more competitive also in this part. Um, also, these activities need to complement activities delivered on the ground in the southeast locations by EU member states. So for example, we know that several consulates, EU member state consulates in, um, in Silicon Valley actually work with uh, local uh, deliver or support somehow their country startups through lending services. So this is definitely not something that we will produce or deliver on, uh, by ourselves, but our programs there on business creation and entrepreneurship actually complement these type of services or even help member states that don't have already these activities to actually uh, yeah, synergize. Um, then it's also about synergizing with other EU programs. Um, the idea here is to avoid um, duplicating efforts, just making the best use of the resources. So we work together with other EU programs on the ground, to deliver our own activities. And last but not least, these activities should contribute to the financial sustainability of the hubs. So this is mainly about covering their own costs so that EAD funding does not need to come in. And it's also about uh, contributing to financial sustainability of participating kids. So this is about promoting the work of the kids, facilitating synergies, collaborations, helping them achieve their uh, objective of financial sustainability. Uh, my last slide is about an example from our hub in Israel. So this is uh, one slide that actually presents the main activities of the hub and the main uh, objective. On the top left, you will see, let's say somehow the mission of the hub, what this is about, but I want to draw your attention actually on the bottom from right to left, where you will see uh, six programs designed through in the last two and a half, three years after the deployment of this, um, of this hub. And they are really offering different types of services and targeting different types of audiences, both European and Israeli. So we start from um, helping uh, European researchers with developing an entrepreneurship mindset through Israeli training. So this is the Mind the Gap program. Uh, we have the Calling to Scale, which is about globalization support for advanced European and Israeli startups. But also we have, as I mentioned before, recovering the gap with the Bridging the Horizon program of consortium building for European and Israeli innovators to help both Israeli and European companies actually thrive in their own areas. So these are some of the examples as part of the new kick you will be able to join any of these activities from your end, but you will also be able, and this can be also part of the proposal, to showcase how you can actually uh, contribute to the strategic objectives of Europe, the EU international cooperation objectives, but also your kick through these type of activities. So that was all with regards to global outreach. Uh, I think I need a break, and probably you also need a break. So next up is a video. So we will be presenting 
um, a short video, a short testimony from one of the of Europe's uh, young creatives and innovator. This is Soraya Wanku. She's a Belgian fashion designer. And the reason that we're setting a testimony from here is because we need you to show you the people that will be the ones benefiting from the ideas that you will put in your proposal. So let's get inspired by Soraya. doing things that you maybe didn't expect it beforehand. It is choosing to go on a different path than what you've known or maybe even what you were expected to do. Innovation as a creative is attributing a certain value or seeing the opportunities in the creative ideas and concepts that as a creative I come up with. Wow. For me, innovation is about making things better, is about changing a status quo. Innovation is about building a certain future. Innovation is seeing value and making things happen. The difference between having a creative idea and innovation is often, yeah, if it's just an idea or just a concept, then not, nothing is happening. So you have to really put the work in it to make it an innovation. And that's where creativity and industries, they, they need each other to to make it happen. So innovation is making things happen that need to happen and that can attribute a value to society. Very well. So that was a short break from Soraya and a piece of, of inspiration also. Um, next up, we're going to start putting together the different puzzles of the European landscape with regards to support to uh, the culture and creative sectors and industries. And our first speaker here uh, will be a colleague from the European Commission, so Barbara Stache, from the uh, Director General for Education and Culture, the Cultural Policy Unit. Barbara is together with, is today with us. She's a policy officer, and she will be presenting about some of the EU programs supporting the culture and creative sectors and industries. Hi, Barbara. Yes, hello. Nice to be here. One second, I need to open the presentation. Can you see it? Yes, full you might want to put it in a full screen view. Yes. Is it okay? More or less. <laughs> yes, Perfect. anyway, so, so um, uh, today I'm speaking about cultural and creative sectors, EU policies and funding. You have heard the uh, what all the different uh, activities that the EIT is doing, also in synergy with uh, other EU funding programs. And I'll just complement the landscape. Um, I, I don't have many slides, so I try to focus myself on cultural and creative sectors and industries, because of course there's also another uh, activity which is uh, centered around cultural heritage, which has also to do with innovation and which is also part of the EIT kick. Um, so this has to be kept in mind to, to kind of bridge the gaps between heritage and cultural and creative industries also. Concerning cultural and creative industries, EU policies, uh, they go in, into different directions. In general, uh, it is about supporting cultural and creative ecosystems which is said in the work plan for, for culture of the council. Skills development is very important. And EU pact for skills for CCIs has been uh, launched some time ago and it's now in the making. There we're also counting on the uh, EIT kick to be um, supporting the skills development for the EU pact for skills. Then there are different projects in, in this uh, connection like FLIP, finance, learning, innovation, and patenting for CCIs, then in the heritage field, charter, ingress projects. They are all about innovation and the CCIs. 
Another topic we're working on is the precariousness, working conditions of artists and cultural and creative uh, professionals, freedom of artistic creation. This is also becoming uh, more and more an important topic, especially with the pandemic and the crisis and people not being able to work. So also this is an important uh, pillar that we are working on now. A copyright fair remuneration of artists. There's um, the copyright reform and um, you know what it means in the platform economy to be a creative. This is also a very important angle of the EU's policy work. And then of course, evidence-based policies, all the data behind it, work with Eurostat. There is a project on measuring culture and creative sectors and industries ongoing because of the different definitions, how to make statistics visible for culture and creative sectors. Uh, so that's, that's also an important body of work. Now, um, whoops. Yes. Uh, since uh, we're talking today about innovation, I would like to point to a publication that has been done together with member states. That's an open method of coordination experts, uh, member states expert group about public policies of, for innovation and entrepreneurship in culture and creative sectors. Uh, you can um, download it so you can see the work that has been done already and good practice sharing with member states on this issue. And a stock taking uh, conference took place in order to assess which of the recommendations on innovation and entrepreneurship in culture and creative sectors and industries, what has been done so far, what still needs to be done. So here on this uh, link, you can find uh, important conclusions there also was a workshop on the eit kick and um, as well as other topics on financing and innovation so you can you can see a, a good stock taking with member states and the culture and creative sectors of what is already done and what needs to be done then i also would like to point out a platform that we have uh, together with the cultural and creative sectors developed, which is Creatives Unite. It was uh, planned as a sharing platform in crisis times, good practice, uh, you know, how to get through the crisis. And now, of course, the crisis is never over, but still the good practice sharing is also going beyond crisis topics. It's also about uh, financing and, and uh, IP and other topics. So this is a an interesting platform you can directly contribute via the contribute button so if you want to showcase something you can also directly um, direct, directly do that and then about creative europe because uh, the creative europe program was mentioned so today uh, i mean there are different eu programs martin uh, mentioned horizon program as well as uh, the, the structural funds regional funds so there are many eu programs the Creative Europe program is the only EU program which focuses only on cultural and creative uh, sectors. Uh, my colleague later on will be talking about the media program. Now this is the Creative Europe culture strand. A lot of new calls will be upcoming. Uh, there is uh, a new call about individual cross-border mobility scheme in follow-up of a project which was called iPortunos. It's about exchanges, artist exchanges. Will be, uh, you know, it will be scaled up and will be developed into a fully fledged uh, mobility scheme for culture. And um, yes, a sectoral approach for specific sectors beyond the EU. Also, there will be calls. In in general, you can see different uh, topics here, and uh, calls are upcoming in the first quarter. I mean, so already January, February, March, March by March, hopefully watch uh, the creative europe space uh, these are smaller calls it's not like the kick which is a huge call but here we are talking about smaller amounts packaged into smaller projects well in in any case how to find the eu funding all these different programs one can get lost of course in 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 that so we launched only two weeks ago uh, the commissioner she launched a culture eu funding guide which uh, basically helps with um, understanding all the different financing sources that are available. For example, even the maritime um, pro uh, programs of the EU have culture inside it or also other programs which you wouldn't really think about. So you can find, uh, you can search 
if by sector and by topic, you can uh, find fi other financing here. Thank you very much uh, and looking forward to exchanging with you. Thank you very much, Barbara. So I have a follow-up question for you. You presented nicely the, the available opportunities for culture and creative sectors and industries, but can you tell us what in your view is how in your view the new kick on culture and creative sectors and industries fit in this nice picture? First of all, scale. I mean, the kick is a, has a different scale of all other EU pro programs so far. It's it's huge and it's I mean, it's incredible. So. I think that the main synergies is, and ideally, depending on who, of course, will be the consortium partners of the EIT kick, but to establish, to pick up everything what, what has been done already and what is being done already with the stakeholders and try to scale it up into, in, in, in different ways uh, because financing is badly needed. And on the other hand, uh, you know, the different networks I was referring to and many other networks, they can actually help uh, the, the EIT kick to be relevant and to, you know, to get also to the smaller players. So I think it's 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 a two-way, you know, interaction process. It's uh, what can the kick do? Yes, I think it can scale up and it can bring meaningful means to programs and, and needs that have been identified so far. For example, in particular, the EU Pact for Skills. How to bring up skills to the twenty-first century. Uh, digital, but also heritage to, you know, we have so much cultural heritage. The kick is also about heritage and how to make it more innovative, how to bring together um, industries, cultural and creative industries and heritage buildings, for example. I think there's a huge strand of work for the kick. Also, Martin mentioned already the structural funds, uh, you know, there have been also very interesting things done with the structural funds and experience, what to do, what not to do. So the kick should ideally, I think, build on that and uh, expand it in the direction which have been proven to work well and uh, try to learn from it and not to work into directions which are, have proven to be working less well. So I think it will be interesting to ex exchange views and to, to, you know, to use the experience of, of different people from the sectors, from the commission, from the cultural and creative networks, you know, to, to, to do this together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. I totally share your enthusiasm, by the way. So next up is um, a colleague from, again, from the European Commission. So Matze Simanovic, he's a policy officer from DigiConnect. And Matze, welcome. Let's have you in our screens. Perfect. And Matze will be talking to us about the media program for Creative Europe. This is correct. Uh, good morning, everybody. I will try to share my screen. Um, I will be talking to you about the Creative Europe, even though you know the support for culture and creative sector is much more broader, right? Uh, just think about the uh, policy areas which are being developed, like the Copyright Directive, Audiovisual Media Service Directive, uh, upcoming the um, uh, Digital Services Act, uh, and, and much more. Let's uh, focus on the Creative Europe now. Can you see my slide, by the way? Not yet. Okay, I started to show. And now? We can see that you started sharing your screen, but uh, we can, okay. yeah, now we can, perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, it's a total new program. Well, it builds on the previous Creative Europe uh, has over 5 billion and uh, media has nearly 1.5. New elements are cross sector collaboration and the support for news media for journalistic uh, cooperation. How is it structured? If I move my mouse, can you see it changes? Sorry. Yes, we can. You might want to uh, reduce a bit the size of your presentation because it, uh, it doesn't cover the full screen, actually. It's, we can't see all of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's stick to this. The, the program has a couple of uh, priorities. The first one is to um, 
help uh, cultural diversity in Europe, the second element, which is also important and maybe even more important in case of media, is to um, uh, increase the competitiveness of, uh, of audiovisual sector in Europe. And uh, this replies to a couple of priorities which are put into this program. So uh, collaborating between the actors, which is uh, super important now because of uh, changes which are which COVID actually uh, created on the market. So, you know, a much more stronger position of uh, distribution platforms, which are not European platforms. And uh, this links also to much more higher budgets. So where, how to structure a European audiovisual sector that it uh, remains relevant, both in business terms and cultural terms. To broaden the ge geographical participation in the, um, in the program, uh, as Commissioner Breton put it, uh, you know, we should think about uh, Europe being our common market and uh, uh, monetization should be, um, should be global. How to better innovate, especially now when uh, we have so many different uh, revolutions actually coming uh, on the market, both in the production and distribution, monetization in reaction to, uh, to audiences and how to scale up the European companies uh, working in the audiovisual sector. So um, make the access to relevant tools, relevant financing easier. And uh, this is uh, projected across the cross-cutting uh, aspects of, of the program, how to make uh, the industry modern, uh, responding to the modern challenges linked to diversity, inclusion, um, greening, digitalization, and the new element of Creative Europe media program is uh, also focused on uh, news media sector, especially on cooperation with news media outlets, with journalists, to provide uh, people better access to unbiased information. Now, how this program works, actually? Yeah. It's a grant program. So it means that uh, annually there are calls published which uh, reply to a number of, uh, of uh, priorities which were identified as uh, the main goals of the program. They are published by uh, executive agency and what we are trying to achieve, we are uh, focusing our work on three main elements. One is the content development for um, better cross-border circulation, so more professional, more appealing content. Uh, then uh, cooperation uh, of the industry to better reply to the um, audience needs and better reply to um, platforms needs if they want to sell and uh, um, professionalization of the sector in, in a way uh, to help them to structure their projects uh, 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 in a way which could then attract uh, financiers to the um, to the um, for the project. And here we are mainly working with a broad uh, spectrum of audiovisual companies, being the film production companies, uh, uh, video games companies, immersive content companies, uh, TV. The second element is business cluster. So uh, the idea here is to increase the skills, talent, cooperate, uh, um, cooperation, but uh, also to showcase uh, works which are in preparation or, or which have been done through uh, the help to participate in business for us or uh, festivals or uh, 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 professional exchanges and the third element which we think is super in important for the support of the um, audiovisual, uh, audiovisual sector in europe is cooperation with audiences so everything which leads to promotion of european works and european culture to education education of young uh, uh, audiences and uh, providing access to the um, to the works uh, in an easier way, for instance, by providing a small subtitling of, um, of film education. Now we also have the cross sectoral uh, labs. I think this links close uh, closely to the key objectives. The the topics here. Uh, very linked to the uh, ground changing uh, revolutions which are uh, ongoing. So here we 
work, for instance, quite closely on the structuring of uh, VR market in Europe. We are looking how to modernize, modernize uh, rights management for the owners of uh, intellectual property rights. How to better use data as the data means money currently. How uh, the European uh, uh, rights owner could have better access to data, not only to monetize on them, but also to to use what, what data to produce uh, something which is needed or more appealing to audiences if they, if they wish so. Uh, those calls uh, are uh, also annual or biannual calls and are also published on the executive agency web page. The, uh, the next element I would like to touch on is maybe not directly Creative Europe, and you will find much more information on the Creative Europe on the dedicated web pages, but an issue of access to finance for the culture and creative sectors. That has been always a problem as the financial institutions in Europe, they did not have a tradition of uh, working with the companies where the majority of the assets are actually immaterial, intellectual property rights. So uh, in 2016, uh, under previous uh, Creative Europe program, the commission created so-called culture and creative sector guarantee facility which is uh, implemented by the European Investment Fund. And actually it provides debt loan finance to culture and creative uh, companies. We had some hesitations at the beginning, but uh, banks really take on on this. And now there are uh, over 20 agreements and majority of the EU countries. And uh, if the company needs working capital and it's some cash flow, they can go to this intermediary, this finance bank or guarantee institution, and get a loan which is backed by, uh, by the commission. Actually, there are uh, nearly 6,000 loans now which are benefiting from this support, and uh, it's going on, and this will continue under uh, the program which was mentioned already here, InvestEU, which is like the main uh, muscle uh, for the financial support through the financial instruments of the commission. And actually culture and creative sectors are one of the uh, political objectives of uh, InvestEU. And actually this brings me to another slide. As we started with uh, uh, debt financing, we were thinking now that uh, as the companies are getting more and more professional, maybe there's another support needed in the form of equity finance. And what has been uh, uh, announced in the media and audiovisual action plan is the creation of uh, a dedicated uh, equity fund for audiovisual production and distribution. This is for the European companies who are seeking bigger investment. And uh, the goal here is more or less the same as it was with a guarantee facility. First and foremost, create a network of investors in Europe who understand the business model of culture and creative sectors. And actually with this program, we are starting very soon. This will be um, beginning of next year when this fund should be put on the on market and the call for investors uh, will be launched. So in a nutshell, it's uh, a bit what we are doing on the finance part. So Creative Europe, uh, InvestEU. We could, of course, talk a lot about uh, what's coming up on the policy side, which will have a huge impact on the, uh, on the culture and creative uh, businesses with all these elements I mentioned briefly at the beginning. So revision of copyright, revision of audiovisual media service directive, upcoming digital services, act, upcoming uh, audio, uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, regulation, data act, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think it's enough of information for such a lot of short time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mati. So I would uh, kindly ask you to sit a bit back and relax as we continue with our next speakers and you will join us again in the panel for the Q&A session at the end. Thanks once again. So we'd like to introduce you now to our next speaker. Um, this is Miss Alessia Di, Gre Di Gregorio, uh, Deputy Head of Unit at DigiCro. Uh, in the unit for proximity, social economy, and creative industries. So, good morning, Alessia. Very nice to have you here with us. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me today. Well, today my intention is uh, to bring you some insight uh, into our work on uh, CCIs uh, in the framework of uh, the industrial policy, support uh, to SMEs and uh, internal market. As you know, concerning uh, our industrial policy, an updated uh, industrial policy strategy was adopted in May 2021, and um, it is precisely a comprehensive and uh, holistic strategy for our European industry, which is actually built uh, on 14 industrial ecosystems. Among them, there is also the CCI's industrial ecosystem, which was unfortunately one of the most hit in the frame of the pandemic crisis, together with the tourism one. But today, I want to focus in particular on two aspects. How do we approach CCI's and what we do to support CCI's? Let me start with our entire approach on how we approach CCI's. First, we want to integrate the creativity and non-technological innovation in industrial value chain, of course, to generate new products, services, processes, and, and so revitalize traditional industries. Second, we want to support the creative professionals and businesses, and so focus on creative industries, in particular those with specific value chain, uh, like uh, fashion design, and um, so develop their business models, new products, uh, services, and especially put them on the market, uh, in our internal market. But uh, how do we support uh, this sector? We see essentially three main ways. I can tell you by enabling a legal framework, by supporting competitiveness and entrepreneurship, and by fostering dialogue with the stakeholders. Let me go first to the to the to the legal framework. We think indeed that create and enabling a legal framework, an appropriate legal framework, it's extremely important also for the CCI sector. And in particular, we do that through the functioning functioning and even better uh, to, uh, through the um, well functioning of the single market, but also through the protection of the intellectual property. In particular, I look here to the importance of the design key because it is really crucial to set a harmonized standard for the protection of registered designs to foster innovation and uh, to develop new products. Second point, as I said, we want to ensure a favorable business environment and support competitiveness and entrepreneurship. And we do that via the single market program, former COSME program. In particular, I can mention, for example, um, our um, aim to, to put in place a kind of a horizontal business support and support to internationalization. And precisely, I can give you three concrete examples Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs, the Enterprise Europe Network, which also includes the dimension, the inter inter international dimension, SME internationalization. And finally, the IPR SME Help Desk. As I told you, the IP aspect, it's very important for us. And this is why, for example, we support experts to provide the free advice and training session on IP issues to help SMEs protect and enforce their IP rights, in particular in relation to China, Latin America and Southeast Asia. And finally, what I need to say is that also we want to tar to, to support creative SMEs for entrepreneurship and business innovation cross-sectoral cooperation, capacity building, just uh, to mention a few ones. Uh, how we do that uh, in uh, concrete terms, uh, I can mention uh, the World Partnership Initiative. This is um, uh, an initiative that uh, we funded via, via the COSME program and um, is all about uh, creating a transnational partnership and supporting a design-driven project and ideas. Indeed, we, uh, we supported the 150 hundred innovative projects. And um, I have to say that uh, there is also a new edition. And um, in, the, in this context, we want to support a new project until 2025. 
But uh, we do also more and we support, uh, for example, uh, European incubation uh, networks for creativity driven innovation and uh, capacity building, of course, for uh, also for creative uh, sing, uh, SMEs. And uh, finally, a last uh, mention to our single market program, former COSME program, which is uh, indeed the way in, uh, through which we try to, to funding SMEs in general and including cult cultural and creative industries and um, SMEs operating in this context. And last but not least, we can provide, as was mentioned by colleagues before, funding for creative companies, mainly through the SME window of the investment the EU program. And uh, now I want um, also mention uh, the third aspect uh, through which uh, we try to support uh, the CCI sector, which is also a crucial one. And uh, it is about uh, the dialogue that we try to to put in place with uh, stakeholders. Uh, in particular, in the context of the industrial policy, we indeed launched uh, a kind of dialogue with the cultural and the creative sectors uh, from uh, 2019. We um, put in place um, a number of workshops uh, during uh, the period 2019-2020. Our objective was um, precisely to, to build a kind of shared understanding about uh, the policy needs of CCIs in the context of the industrial policy, the framework conditions for the competitiveness of the European CCIs in global value chains, and also the conditions for cross-sectoral cooperation and the role of CCIs as triggers for industrial innovation. Clearly, we see here an opportunity to connect the creative economy with the EU industrial policy agenda. This provides a kind of of snapshots of the EU action in the framework of our uh, industrial policies, SME and uh, internal market policies for creative prof professional and businesses, uh, of course. A last point before concluding, uh, I want to mention uh, the 2020 edition of the European Social Competition, uh, sorry, of the European Social Innovation Competition. Today, I mean, uh, this year uh, edition, uh, um, has the title of Reimagine Fashion, Changing Behaviors for Sustainable Fashion. This is uh, very much important because um, uh, it links us to today's discussion. And I can tell you, we received a very interesting uh, project uh, looking at ways uh, we produce, buy, use, uh, recycle fashion, and so encourage more sustainable cons consumer behavior. This competition opened to entrance of from uh, across the EU member states and the uh, horizon 2020 associated countries uh, has achieved its final step. The three winning ideas uh, will be announced uh, tomorrow during uh, the award ceremony, and uh, each of which will uh, receive an award of uh, five uh, uh, of uh, sorry 50,000 euro. With this, I conclude my uh, presentation and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessia. You complemented really nicely the picture of EU programs uh, supporting the sectors. Um, I will ask you to join us in a bit. We have one uh, last presentation by a colleague from the European Innovation Council. So uh, we have some questions for you. So please join us in a bit. Um, next one is Federico, Federico Esu, uh, Policy and Legal Advisor at the European Innovation Council. So Federico, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning and thank you for having me here. I'll immediately share the screen. Please let me know if you see the presentation. We can see the screen, Federico, if you just yeah. want to put it on presentation mode. Yeah. That would be great. Perfect. Can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Um, you might also want to go to the display settings and change the setting because we can also see your notes. Yes, that's the one. You are ready? Yeah. Shall I proceed? Yes, please. Yeah. So again, thank you for having me. I'll, uh, 
I will present you now the, um, the European Innovation Council, the main instruments uh, that uh, uh, are contained in this, uh, in this program for innovators uh, and, and entrepreneurs in Europe. Uh, and I'll also show you, complementary to what Mark has already uh, said in the beginning, what are the existing synergies with the European Innovation uh, Institute, with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology and its kicks. Um, as uh, probably most of you know, uh, but also for those who don't know, the European Innovation Council has been, uh, um, it, it became fully fledged uh, under Horizon Europe uh, after a pilot phase uh, between 2018 and 2020. Uh, it is Europe's most ambitious innovative initiative, uh, uh, first of all, in terms of budget, uh, as it uh, um, has a budget of 10.1 billion euros for the whole uh, um, uh, framework uh, for the whole duration of the framework program. Uh, the main mission of the European Innovation Council is to uh, identify, develop and scale up high risk innovations. Uh, and so to help uh, European innovations to overcome what is currently holding back indeed uh, innovation throughout Europe. Um, the focus is uh, especially on deep tech and disruptive market creating innovation, but we will see later how this can also, of course, concern uh, the new kick and the, and the entrepreneurs and, and companies that will be supported by it. Um, it is unique uh, um, in the way it combines support to uh, deep tech research uh, on emerging technologies with a, a program that you will see in a bit is the accelerator uh, that aims at supporting startups and SMEs and scale ups. So it covers the whole range that goes from support to uh, research to the scaling up and commercialization of the idea. It is characterized by a proactive approach uh, and flexible funding uh, because we have um, the EIC program managers uh, who help us manage a portfolio of projects and to uh, steer the direction of, uh, of our funding and of our support. Uh, another characteristic of the EIC is the EIC fund, which was officially established in 2020, and it uh, can be considered nowadays the largest VC uh, deep tech investor in Europe, uh, with an overall budget of uh, 3 billion euros to invest uh, in, in equity, quasi-equity and various other uh, financial instruments. And uh, of course, it's very important for today's uh, discussion uh, and within the context and framework of the Pillar 3 of Horizon Europe, uh, uh, the EIC uh, complement uh, what is also done uh, by the EIT and by the innovation ecosystems, the two main uh, uh, pillars under this uh, sector, uh, this, uh, this uh, section, Innovative Europe of Horizon Europe. Um, this is an overview, this slide gives you an overview of the three main instruments of the European Innovation Council. Like I said, uh, the first one is the Pathfinder, which focuses mostly on support to early stage research. And it does so uh, uh, through uh, grants. Uh, so the support is erogated mostly in the form of grants. Uh, and it's for those for those of you familiar with uh, uh, the previous uh, FET uh, uh, program, it's basically the successor of the FET uh, program. Um, in between uh, the uh, early stage research and the accelerator, there is a so-called transition activities, uh, uh, which is uh, a scheme that focuses mostly on uh, the, the technology maturation. So uh, to move from the proof of concept to the validation in the market. And of course, it allows, it tries to allow um, uh, companies and individual entrepreneurs to uh, reach uh, business and market readiness. And again, uh, like the Pathfinder, the transition to uh, erogate its support in the form of grants uh, of maximum 2.5 million. Um, the third uh, main instrument is the accelerator, uh, which is which focuses on the last part of the development uh, of the idea and of the innovations. Uh, and, it, uh, and it does so, it helps uh, companies and entrepreneurs uh, uh, by means of uh, blended finance, which is a mix of uh, grant support of 2.5 million and equity support in the form of 15 million. So combined together, if a company requests both the grant and the equity support, uh, and it gets uh, and is granted both the forms of support, the total amount of support is 17.5 uh, million euros. It is, again, for those familiar with what was uh, happening previously, um, uh, is the successor of the SME instrument, although with uh, several differences. 
Um, on the right side of this presentation, you have uh, an overview of what are the main characteristics of the AC, and it complements what I said previously in the previous slide. Uh, here, what is worth mentioning also, again, for the purposes of today's presentation, is that the, the form of the support provided by the AC is mainly bottom-up, so it's open to any thematic area, apart from the specific targets or specific challenges that are identified in our work program every year. Uh, we are supported in, uh, from the strategic point of view, but also from the implementation point of view, we are supported by the um, uh, advisory service and the expertise provided by the EIC board. We just appointed our board and we are in the process of uh, nominating the president of the board. This is a board composed of leading innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, researchers, and actors uh, that are very active in the ecosystem, in the innovation ecosystem in Europe, and who help us indeed, like I said, in the strategic vision of the AC, but also more concretely on implementation. And the three instruments that you see in this slide are all complemented by so-called business acceleration services. So we provide both to applicants, but also, and of course, to beneficiaries. We provide them with coaches and mentors who help them and not only develop the, their ideas concretely, but also they help them develop their proposals when they are in the process of applying uh, to our instruments. Uh, but we also put them in, in touch with corporates, investors, and other ecosystem actors. Uh, like I said before, this is a, a, a big characteristic, a big feature of the EIC is it's a proactive management, uh, much more agile and much more flexible, so much more innovator and entrepreneur friendly. And uh, a novelty uh, about which I will uh, say more details in a bit is the fast track scheme. The fast track scheme is a novelty under Horizon Europe and it allows uh, the kicks, uh, the EIT kicks to uh, send uh, uh, companies, their companies directly to the full proposal stage of the EIC accelerator. But like I said, I will show you in a bit more details what's been done so far in that, uh, in that area. Um, Martin already gave uh, uh, the overview and explained that indeed at the beginning of 2021, the EIC and the EIT have signed a memorandum of understanding although this is just uh, one of the um, uh, milestones achieved in the cooperation between the two entities, because uh, indeed, as it was pointed out, uh, this uh, the cooperation between the two and synergies were already implemented uh, during the pilot phase of the EIC, so already since uh, uh, the previous years. But uh, indeed, in January, we signed a memorandum of understanding, uh, and the rationale behind this, uh, uh, the signature of this important document is that uh, it was, uh, it is uh, very important that that, uh, the EIC and the EIT join forces uh, uh, and coexist uh, in a, in a complemented manner uh, under the uh, third pillar of Horizon Europe. Uh, it, it was requested also by Commissioner Gabriel uh, that uh, it uh, that uh, the EIT and the ESC should, so, should show uh, and demonstrate unity of action in their support for innovators in Europe. And indeed, because there are uh, actual synergies that can be exploited uh, also at the operational level. The Memorandum of Understanding was a, a sign after uh, uh, intense and very collaborative work between, uh, uh, between uh, the, involving also the EIC and the EIT boards. Um, and that showed indeed that there was a strong cooperation and, and, and the willingness on both parties to, to reach uh, such a framework uh, for cooperation. Um, more concretely, what's been done uh, so far also uh, under the, the Memorandum of Understanding, but not only, um, we have signed four uh, coordination and support action grants with the four uh, of the eight kicks, in particular in the field of Green Deal with Dino Energy and Climate, in the, in the area of health with uh, the health kick, and currently we are in the, the, in the signature phase of the grant agreement with the digital kick uh, under the area digital age. The, um, this, uh, the purpose of these grants uh, is to indeed uh, uh, test uh, and, and to concretely um, implement ways of uh, uh, establishing an integrated support to innovation through these uh, four pilots. So of course, there will be further discussions uh, later on in 2022 and the following years uh, uh, to see what will be the features of the CSAs, if new CSA will be signed and with which kicks and so on. But this is a good example of what's already uh, there. 
uh, another important examples, uh, example is the fast track scheme. So uh, more in details, what is the fast track scheme? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the fast track scheme is a novelty. It's uh, currently contained in Annex 4 to the EIC work program. And uh, uh, it allows, uh, like I said before, previous uh, companies, companies that have been previously supported by the KICS, to um, undergo a project review performed by the KICS themselves. And uh, if they successfully pass this project review, they will be able to uh, submit directly a full proposal to the EIC accelerator. So they will not go through the step one of the EIC accelerator, but they will be able to build immediately in our platform a full proposal. Um, so this means that a much like, like the name itself suggests uh, is, a, is a fast track process uh, to allow these companies to be plugged into the accelerator uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a much, uh, in, in a faster and more coordinated manner. We have developed a guidance document for these purposes uh, with the several interactions with the kicks as well. And uh, this guidance document complemented by the provisions in our work program are basically the main uh, uh, documents that help uh, the kicks uh, uh, implement the fast track. We already had some uh, uh, kicks uh, uh, submitting some of their companies during the last October cutoff of the accelerator, but we are continuing uh, with the interactions with the kicks because, of course, we expect uh, um, the full uh, use of the fast track as from 2022, so from the first cutoff of the accelerator in 2022. Um, what is the state of play currently of the EIC and EIT cooperation? Uh, we want to, of course, uh, increasingly translate uh, the good intentions of cooperation into actual synergies. And what I've seen, uh, shown you so far shows that there is already uh, concrete actions in this direction. Um, there's been several meetings, uh, high-level meetings between the management uh, and also involving uh, uh, the, the, the board uh, of, both, uh, of both entities. Uh, and we had a very fruitful uh, operational workshop uh, uh, in October, last October, where there's been attendees from both the DAC and the KICS. Uh, and uh, we were divided in different breakout rooms where we had the opportunities to, again, further explore synergies uh, between, uh, between uh, the EAC and the various KICS. The key priority is now for the upcoming uh, months and years is to establish uh, stronger principles on how to cooperate. And so what is the best way to provide uh, support to startups in a coordinated fashion? Uh, we want to link increasingly the business acceleration services provided by the IC with the ones of the AT and vice versa. Um, we, there is the um, opportunity to also go beyond the fast track. Of course, the fast track, which I already explained to you, uh, is uh, still in the explorative phase, but we expect a strong use of these instruments by the kick. But we want to also explore the possibility to go uh, forward and to create uh, some fast track processes also for other existing programs and initiatives uh, of uh, both parties. Um, there may be some follow-up uh, coordination and support actions to the four one that I've already showed you uh, in my previous slides. And uh, we are currently exploring ways to establish a framework for data sharing. And this is particularly important because as Martin correctly showed earlier, um, several uh, uh, companies that have been supported, uh, including in the last round of the AC Accelerator, have been previously supported by the KICS. So this shows uh, that a lot of the companies supported by KICS uh, become eligible and suitable for receiving support uh, under the AC Accelerator. And so in order to make sure that there is a a constant flow of data between uh, the KICS and the EIC in order to indeed know which companies are participating in which program. We are currently collaborating with the KICS uh, and, and at the EIC internally to see how to better establish a framework for such, a, for such data sharing. Um, in terms of the next steps, the most immediate steps, uh, we are, uh, of course, we have been, uh, now we are currently at the EAC, we are currently in the adoption phase of our 2022 work program, and during the adoption phase and the drafting phase, we've been interacting with the EAT, welcoming their feedback and input, uh, so we've been aligning uh, our work program with the one uh, of the EAT. We are developing joint communication materials, uh, so to send, in order to send a, a very uh, coherent uh, message to external stakeholders, but also to uh, potential uh, beneficiaries and applicants of, the, of our instruments. 
Um, we are, like I said before, we've just appointed our EAC board and we expect to have a dedicated working groups that will be liaising uh, with AAT and its kicks uh, in order to indeed explore further synergies. And we are developing a roadmap for implementation of the joint activities in 2022 with a more detailed timeline and also more detailed monitoring and reporting tools. Uh, I would like to conclude because I think it can be interesting to the to those of you in the audience that are uh, indeed uh, um, interested in, in the new kick. Um, I would like to I took the liberty of selecting two previous beneficiaries uh, of EAC support, uh, one during the pilot phase and one under the fully fledged EAC, uh, to show you what type of companies uh, uh, there are uh, that have uh, that implement or um, uh, develop technologies uh, that are uh, across different disciplines including indeed uh, what uh, the discipline supported under this new kick. Um, I've highlighted here two companies. Uh, one is uh, an Italian company that uh, develops uh, virtual human-like voices, which are emotionally resonant. And this is very, um, very interesting for the culture sector and creative sector because uh, uh, those uh, voices, uh, th these tools uh, enable to dub virtual voices in, into any target uh, language. So this uh, can be of, uh, of interest to entertainment or advertising companies. And the other company is a German-based company, a German company that uh, uh, developed an output technology and this uh, targets uh, um, uh, all the uh, blind people uh, and it allows them to access any digital information without uh, uh, receiving or needing uh, any additional help from other people. So this is just two concrete examples to show you that uh, the EIC provides support to deep tech uh, and, and breakthrough technologies, uh, but we don't have any uh, specific thematic restriction in terms of what type of technologies we support. So um, several of the technologies that will stand probably uh, by the by the new kick uh, will be eligible and will be suitable candidates to apply and receive support uh, from the EIC. And uh, with this slide, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federico. Please stay with us. And I would kindly ask all uh, speakers to join us in the panel. Please switch on your cameras. Federico, please be so kind to stop sharing your screen because we're yes. coming directly to the Q&A part. We're a bit behind uh, schedule, let's say here. But I think we can reply to some questions. And I'll ask all the speakers to be right to the point. So, uh, Barbara, Alessia, Mace, please switch on your cameras. Perfect. And I would like to start with Martin, who was our sp first speaker. And Martin, we have a question for you. Uh, so, can you please give an example of how collaboration with the Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions and Erasmus Plus uh, could look like? Thank you, Katerina, and thanks for the question. Again, just checking that the correct microphone is turned on on my computer, uh, seems to be the case. Uh, there's definitely an immense potential for these synergies, but some of them we have already forced and put to, to, to practice uh, both programs. Um, let me just give more examples than, than potentials. I think key is here the help that the EIT can do for um, transiting from academia to startup life. Basically, I think that's the that's the key aspect uh, in 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 this regard to support the transition from really the science to to business. So to that end, uh, there are a couple of examples. One is that through the alumni associations of EIT, we have a very strong collaboration with, for example, uh, uh, Marie Curie Alumni Association, but also Erasmus uh, Mundus uh, as well. A lot of uh, events, hackathons on this uh, on this. Um, occasion. I can also mention the Digi Edu Hack, which is an EIT initiative under the Digital Education Action Plan of the Commission. And uh, basically, this is the uh, future of Erasmus, so <laughs> carbon-free uh, mobility network uh, challenge, basically. And here the challenge was to find new ways to transform the students' educational uh, experience, uh, basically. Uh, that's probably another example. I don't think we have time to go into the, the details. I can also give uh, examples of concrete programs. Um, for example, uh, um, programs, uh, International Master in Innovation, uh, Innovative Medicine program, which is uh, financed uh, through EIT 
um, health involving different universities, um, which is developing um, curricula, which on the other hand also has Erasmus recognition. So this provides uh, transferable European uh, credits uh, and basically is also an EIT labeled program. This one is um, for students with, I don't know, background in biochemistry, pharmaceutical sciences, uh, etc. But probably as an example, this highlights uh, or exemplifies the potential. Thank you very much, Martin. Okay. Uh, I hope we covered the person that asked the question. If you need more questions, you can always reach out to us. Um, so the next question is actually for Alessia. And Alessia, the question is, um, how can the new knowledge innovation community, EAD culture and creativity, best support SMEs in the culture and creative sectors and industries? Can you please unmute yourself? The usual issue. <laughs> Okay, now I think you can uh, hear me, right? Yes. Okay, very good. No, I was saying that uh, this is uh, indeed a crucial question. Uh, clearly, we we attach uh, great importance uh, to support innovation in the CCI sector. And many actions uh, have been performed in the past, and of course, it will continue in the future. I think about, in particular, to what has been done, uh, for example, under the Horizon Europe program, Pillar 2, which is really a crucial one. And uh, But uh, this is not the only one because uh, for example I can uh, focus here on our specific on action to give support for uh, creative SMEs uh, to boost uh, precisely entrepreneurship and business innovation and uh, we do that in particular in the frame uh, of the single market program uh, today and in the past uh, we did it uh, under the former COSME program. During my presentation I had the chance uh, to give you one uh, concrete example uh, which was uh, the fourth partnership project and uh, again I, I insist on the fact that for us it's a really a very important initiative because uh, through this initiative we can concretely support the partnership between designers and manufacturing companies and tech providers to integrate the creative and technology skills into traditional companies and so create a higher value added products, services, processes and business models. And uh, um, maybe I can um, I can uh, I can say here that uh, it's a very it's a very important uh, to to know that uh, given uh, the successful result that we had uh, with this initiative, uh, we are launching a second uh, edition, and uh, the call is open uh, until uh, tw um, the second February 2022 to apply. Furthermore, we have also supported supported the European uh, incubation network again under the single market program in order to support creativity driven innovation. I can give you a, two concrete examples. So this was done by the fine network on fashion tech and by the custom network in the context of tourism businesses integrating cultural and creative industries with cutting edge of technology. Thank you very much, Alessia. And we continue with the next question, which is for Mathieu. So Mathieu, can you please share with us how do you think that the media industries contribute to strengthening the innovation capacity in the culture and creative sectors and industries? That's a broad question, but uh, let's start with video games, for instance. When you talk about video games, you know that they were first adopters of artificial intelligence. And now, when we are thinking about film production, you see that video games engines are used in the virtual production. It changes a lot in terms of you know how the production is organized, for instance, the costs linked to this, the interaction of the audiences. When you are thinking about virtual productions, you are talking about new distributions and new audiences as well. So everything which links to actual deployment of virtual reality. And now we were confronted with this metaverse project, which apparently is going to change lives of some of us and when you are talking about uh, vr distributions through vr goggles you are talking about uh, question of audiences legal questions questions of privacy so everything is interconnected now i think the 
culture and creative sectors, and especially all those which are linked to audiovisual work, uh, ongoing uh, tremendous change. The tremendous change would not only change the business models, it's a great opportunity for innovators. There's a very valid question what is the European uh, answer to this global changes which are ongoing, knowing that uh, platforms for distributions are uh, global or not European, at least. Uh, so business questions, audience questions, uh, technological questions, I think uh, there is a, a lot of subjects uh, which uh, the key on culture and creative sectors will uh, actually have to tackle if where this angle is interesting for uh, people participating to to kick and uh, uh, it's not on it's this will be not for sure done in a kind of a silo i was mentioning some of the policies which are being developed at the european level so this work on this innovation linked to virtualization of our experiences will be somehow put into the broader context of the changing policies in Europe. I don't know if this uh, answers your question, but uh, I think this is a fascinating topic, very timely topic, uh, where for sure a lot of investment and thinking will have to go. So I would say that uh, some elements of this kick will be super relevant. Thank you very much, Monsieur. Um, so being mindful of the very limited time we have, and we're a bit already over our time, I would like to go back to Federico and Martin. So there is a question actually about um, asking to elaborate a little bit more on the strategic and operating synergies between EAC and the EAT kicks in terms of shared ecosystems and financial instruments. I actually believe that Federico really uh, elaborated quite a lot on the operational part. I just want to ask each one of you whether you want to complement by adding something. Martin, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, indeed, I mean, Federico is very extensive on this. So probably I would just highlight here the uh, Bridgehead program uh, of EIT Health, which has been going on uh, for some time now. Uh, and that's also open to EIC startups as well. Um, this is seeking, of course, the synergies between the two organizations uh, as well. But you have seen also the results to the fast track, which is the other way around uh, with a very good hit rate from uh, the supported companies by, by EIT Health. So here the idea is, of course, making sure that uh, you know, both instruments, EIT and EIC, have some unique uh, features and strengths. And this might be relevant at different stages of development for different type of, uh, of companies. And with this collaboration, what we would like to do is that we have a funnel, we have a pipeline between the two organizations in a logical manner, uh, at the right time, at the right place. But also in order to do so, we need the collaboration between EIT and EIC, but also at the operational level, directly uh, under these agreements of EIC and the, the kicks uh, as well. Of course, uh, this means that all the potential uh, tools uh, and, 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 and uh, supporting schemes EIC offers is also ready uh, and available for those that uh, came from the EIT ecosystem um, as well. I don't know, Federico, if you would like to add something more. Yeah, I would like to simply complement by stressing on the on the relevance and importance of the fast track scheme because indeed, like you said, Martin, uh, um, for example, I know that uh, EIT Health Kick just uh, um, concluded a call for expression of interest for their own uh, supported uh, uh, startups and and, and companies uh, uh, for the fast track scheme, uh, meaning that they will soon uh, uh, conduct the project review of these companies and those companies that are deemed not only eligible but also. Uh, they meet the criteria requested for the fast track, uh, will be able to submit their full proposals directly uh, from uh, at the first cutoff available uh, in 2022. And we expect that this, we are interacting uh, almost on a weekly basis with the various kicks because we expect them to make a strong use of the fast track scheme. And, um, and that's going to be a, a great example of the existing concrete synergies between, uh, between the kicks and the AC. Thank you very much to both. I would also compliment, if you allow me, by clarifying, because I just saw a question in the, um, in the chat, that um, the coordination and support action signed with the four kicks between the four kicks and the EIC for with this 1 million funding, the funding comes from the EIC. 
So just to provide clarity on this. Um, one last question I kept for myself, from our audience. This is about our plans to realize a global outreach program related to the cross click activity. So this is a global outreach program of the EIT in terms of time, phase and outcomes. And the question is also about what would be the role of particular co-location centers with this respect. So just to clarify that the EIT co-location centers are EIT shared offices and co-creation and collaboration spaces that are based in EU member states. So when we talk about the EIT Global Outreach Program, we talk about EIT community hubs. There is a different wording because there is a different type of meaning. Um, where we have local staff working to deliver activities mainly designed and implemented by the PICS. So it's a slightly different concept. With regards to the plan of the Global Outreach Program, well, now with the new approach, the new uh, EU approach, the global approach on research and innovation, we're currently reviewing our plans. Uh, we're looking how we can adjust so we can fully be aligned with the EU priorities in the sector. And as every year, these priorities will be translated to the annual business plans or by annual, as of this year, of the kicks in concrete proposals and, and, um, and action plans. So there is a very specific approach and strategically this is steered by the EIT, the EIT governing board in close collaboration with the European Commission. Uh, one last question, which I want to thank you very much for asking it. So how do you plan to attract or support single innovators beyond 40s? Well, um, all of us working in the area of innovation really we don't see the aids here we see the potential here we, we see the innovation in the ideas how we go beyond and we need all the ages all types of backgrounds to make this happen so um eic programs eid programs other programs mentioned by other colleagues of the european commission they don't have any criteria on age they have criteria on how you bring the best ideas on the table and we want to bring just a, um, connect the the right actors to make this happen so I want to thank all of you for being here today with us, all of our speakers. I appreciate and value your time, our audience for actually asking uh, really interesting questions. For those questions that we couldn't answer, please uh, follow up to our webpage on the dedicated uh, page for the call. For non-call related questions, which I understand that might also be very interesting to you, please approach us through the uh, EIT um, uh, functional mailbox on stakeholder relations. I ask my colleagues to put it in the chat for non uh, for uh, questions not related to the call. Um, last but not least, I remind I want to remind you that the call uh, will be closed on the 22nd of March. You have a few months to do your homework. You have a few months to start preparing uh, really interesting bottom up ideas to serve the sectors to support the sectors in this very, very challenging, but also a period that offers a great opportunity for all of us. And please be inspired because we're really looking forward, not only us here, the, the, uh, the entire European Commission and you. So a big thanks to everyone. I'm sorry that uh, I came with an uh, additional 10 minutes, but I do hope that you enjoyed that. Have a nice day ahead. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.